one minute? She wants to wait two minutes. Good evening. I'm Mayor Donald T. Lopez, Village of Los Ranchos de Albuquerque, and I want to welcome all of you this evening to our 4th Street Revitalization Project Phase 2 public information meeting. I want to do a few introductions. Uh, we do have members of our Board of Trustees here this evening. We have uh, Gil Benavidez, we have Alan Lewis, Sandra Pacheco, and I did see George Radnovich walk in the door, but he's not seated right now, so he'll be here. That means we have, a, we have the full Board of Trustees staff here tonight, and that's wonderful. Well, I already mentioned him. I mentioned Alan. Of course I did. And we have some planning and zoning commissioners here this evening, too. Um, I see J.T. Michelson here. Thank you for coming, J.T. Okay. Connie Barrow, thank you for coming. And I'm not sure if I see any other planning and zoning commissioners here right now. Okay. The Village of Los Ranchos staff that's here, Ann Simon, Tiffany Justice, Danielle Cedillo Molina, and of course, Maria Rinaldi. We have four presenters this evening. We have Maria Rinaldi. We have Jeanette Walter with Bohannon Houston. We have uh, Devin Kenamore, is that correct? With uh, subcontractor to Bohannon Houston, and Vince Steiner with Bohannon Houston. Is there anybody else from Bohannon that I did not recognize? I think you're from Bohannon, right? Yeah. Thank you, and you too. Wonderful, thank you for helping us set up. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Maria. Maria, it's... Oh yes, we have the Department of Transportation here this evening. Mr. Tim Chavez, thank you Tim for attending. Uh, welcome to the Village of Los Ranchos, and we look forward to working with you on this project. Thank you very, very much for coming. Anything else, Maria? Okay, it's yours. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our public hearing this evening. I just want to quickly give you an overview of the process that we've been undertaking for the past year so that you know what the starting point is in the public information meeting this evening. We retained the services of Bohannon Houston, Inc., um, their retainer engineer with the Village of Los Ranchos, which means they are in contract with the village. And they were issued a task order for preliminary engineering to take us to 30% design review for this project. This project will be designed 100% all the way to the village limits just north of Ortega, but it will be built in three phases of construction, which we'll get into, excuse me, in the presentation. But the 30% design review, which will be completed with the um, selection of one of the alternatives proposed tonight, basically looked at existing conditions, physical conditions of the roadway to include the right of way, um, the width of the roadway, the level of service for traffic volume and, and movements along the roadway and at intersections. It looked at the location of wet and dry um, utilities in proximity to the roadway or in the roadbed itself. We looked at environmental and cultural resources as part of this review. 
Okay, and then they were tasked, oh, stormwater. Stormwater is a big one. We also looked at the need for stormwater management throughout the corridor. And then they were tasked with coming up with alternatives for selection of what could be done within this roadway to promote safety, to create a road diet, which means the reduction of traffic lanes, and to propose improvements for pedestrian facility, landscape, and other amenity. And what you're gonna to see tonight are the alternatives that they've come up with through this process. We'll talk about the funding that we have available and how that relates to the phasing of construction. But I really quickly want to pass out, I'm just gonna start it here with Vince and he's gonna pass them out beyond me. We have a, um, a form for you here that has, may I impose on you? that has the five alternatives that will be discussed tonight. And there's a space for comment. If you're not comfortable giving comment, we will also pass out the microphone to take any comment at the end of, at the end of the um, presentation here. But feel free to add any additional comment and select your preferred alternative. We'd like to know after you've seen them if you have a preference which one that is. So again, thank you so much for attending tonight. This is incredibly important part of the process as we move forward into final design. So I'm going to turn this over to Jeanette. And I will run the slides for you. Great. Thank you, Maria. So um, you can go to the vicinity map. <laughs> so this project is, is a continuation of the phase one project, which was constructed between Osuna, Travis Roads, and Pueblo Solano. How about now? Okay, sorry. <laughs> this, this project is a continuation of the phase one project which was constructed between Osuna Chavez Roads and Pueblo Solano. Um, phase two will start at Pueblo Solano and end at the village limits a few hundred feet north of Ortega Road. <laughs> um, phase one created a gateway to the village. It included a road diet which reduced the roadway from four lanes to uh, one lane in each direction with a center turn lane. Um, the additional space that was gained was used for sidewalks, lighting, landscaping, and bus stops. Phase two will continue the road diet to the village boundary with pedestrian facilities and improved drainage. The village will include decorative features from phase one as allowed by funding. The village would very much like to include the landscaping, the lighting, and the improved bus stops. Um, these are pictures of the existing roadway. <clears throat> Currently, there are three traffic signals at Los Ranchos, Ranchitos, and El Pueblo. The road is uh, two lanes in each direction with some shoulders, and um, there is 60 feet of right of way, which is just outside of the power poles in that picture. <laughs> Um, there are a lot of driveways. Some businesses are operating right up to the edge of the roadway. There are two schools, Los Ranchos Elementary and North Valley Academy on 4th Street. Um, Taylor Middle School is just 250 feet west of 4th Street. And, and when it rains, there is standing water near the south end of the project. Um, so this is a bus route. There is one improved bus route or additional right-of-way was obtained. Most bus routes are like the third picture, which are just a sign. There are a few benches that are on private property. <laughs> okay, so there are lots of uh, utilities out there, and currently there is no place to walk except along the shoulder of the roadway. <laughs> So um, narrowing the roadway to three lanes does allow room for pedestrian facilities. We looked at five alternatives for pedestrians. And the first is a trail on the east side, which would be separated from the road by a landscape buffer. Landscaping would also be added on the west side of the road. However, there would be uh, no walking path on that side of the road. <laughs> the advantage of a trail is that bicycles could use it as well as pedestrians. However, bicycles would have to ride in the street south of Pueblo Solano. Um, a trail is on the same side of the street as the senior apartments, um, but you would only be able to fit bus stops on the side of the road with the trail. They would not, you would not be able to place them on the other side of the roadway. Um, 
But, and one thing that this allows is it allows for water harvesting. And if you can go to the next slide, it'll explain what that is. Um, this is a photo from Second Street where they have made curb cuts to drain storm water into some landscaping that's along the roadway. Now that is a picture taken in the winter time, so it is kind of sparse looking. But um, by doing that, you have uh, less irrigation that's needed for the landscaping. It reduces um, the storm drain system needs. It cleans the water as it infiltrates into the ground and it helps to replenish groundwater. So there would just be inlets uh, similar to that little picture in the corner which would pick up the water in the landscaping that once it overflowed. <laughs> So the second alternative is just taking the same trail and moving it to the other side of the road. <laughs> um, this one is on the same side of the road as the schools are, which is a bit of an advantage, but it has all of the same disadvantages of alternative one. <laughs> if you can go to the third one. Okay, so we also looked at putting a sidewalk on both sides of the road. Um, the sidewalk would meander a bit, but it would meander where we needed to miss um, utilities that were next to the, um, closer to the right-of-way line, and then we'd bring the sidewalk into the road, and then we'd go back out again. It, it's preferable if we can keep the sidewalk separated from the roadway by a, a landscaping buffer. <laughs> um, by doing the... Um, the sidewalk and the curb with the curb and gutter, we would have to put curb breaks to get water into the landscaping. You wouldn't have as much capacity as if there isn't a curb. <laughs> and for that reason, we looked at a, a fourth alternative. <laughs> so this is uh, basically the same alternative, except instead of putting in a curb and gutter, we would put in a state an estate curb in. And there's a photo in the corner of Tinan Road here in Los Ranchos, which has estate curbs all the way along. Um, there's, no, there's no curb. It's just flat concrete. It helps define the edge of the roadway, makes it more visible at night. Um, but the water can flow right over it into the uh, water harvesting areas, which is an advantage. <laughs> and it also keeps the edge of the roadway from breaking up if someone gets too far over. <laughs> So, and then the last alternative we have is to um, not in put in any landscaping, but put in bike lanes on both sides of the road with sidewalk. <laughs> uh, one reason that we looked at this is because this is the uh, current plan that Bernalillo County is planning on doing north of the village limits to Alameda. <laughs> um, the advantage of this is that it would help connect some of the bike trails in the area. For example, there's a bike trail along Alameda, and there's the bike trail along Paseo del Norte. Um, it would provide a connection to that. Um, however, it would be by far the most expensive storm drain system because we wouldn't be able to do water harvesting. Um, we would have to put in uh, as many as 115 drop inlets to pick up the what's called the 100-year storm and, and uh, handle the water. <laughs> so um, we can go to the next one. Okay, we also looked at alternatives for the intersections. We looked at potentially putting roundabouts at all of the signalized intersections. And we also looked at a potential roundabout at Ortega. Now, um, we could not fit it in at Los Ranchos or Ortega. At Ortega, there's a business that's, that and houses all very close to the right-of-way that would be impacted if we tried to put a roundabout there. On um, Los Ranchos, there's a school on one side, and it's very difficult to use school property for a roadway, so the entire roundabout would have to be shifted to the east, which would have a pretty severe impact on the businesses there. So we eliminated those. But we're still considering... Um, a roundabout at Ranchitos, and one at El Pueblo. <laughs> um, the roundabouts do reduce the uh, delay for traffic with the current traffic signal in the morning peak hour, the delay, for example, at El Pueblo is about 19 seconds per vehicle on average. And with a roundabout, it's only seven seconds per vehicle. 
Um, roundabouts um, don't have any electricity cost. So from that standpoint, it's a benefit to the, to the village. Um, they improve safety because of the low speed and the fact that all the traffic isn't going in one direction. It's impossible to get right angle crashes um, or head on collisions, which are the t most severe types of accidents where, where people are, are injured and, and occasionally die. So uh, for that standpoint, a roundabout is much safer. Um, they're also considered safer for pedestrians because they only have to cross one direction of travel at a time, and then they have an island to stand in in the middle if they need to wait for a gap in traffic. <laughs> okay, so uh, we are looking at, we need somewhere to store all this storm water that we're picking up, and we're looking at using underground stormwater storage and infiltration which could have a park or a parking lot on top of it. Um, for example, in this case, the storm drain comes in from the side and it drains into those pipes that are underground that you do not see. And um, they are made by a lot of different companies. This particular one is, is like arches that are open in the bottom so the water can soak into the ground. <laughs> um, the next example is a, another one. In this case, this is a park in Bernalillo where um, they use it as a soccer field and a park, but it is also a storm drain pond. <laughs> so we're looking at multiple uses so we don't have to take up uh, valuable property and, and just use it for a pond. <laughs> and the next one. So um, right of way would have to be obtained for the ponds. We're looking at a parcel just south of Roll Road um, and one at El Pueblo. And then some right-of-way is also needed in order to build a roundabout if, if that's the preferred alternative. Uh, there would be some right-of-way needs that are shown in those figures. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, the schedule is to complete the study um, after this public meeting. We're also going to be completing the environmental clearance soon, and then we're gonna do a preliminary design for the corridor from one end to the other. Um, at that time, right-of-way acquisition would start for the ponds, and um, we would look at final design for, uh, I wrote phase one here, but it's really phase 2A. Uh, we're looking at breaking the corridor, which is about one and a half miles long, into three pieces for construction. And that's um, because of funding and construction costs. So now I'll turn it over to Maria to talk about the funding. We currently have all of the engineering funded through numerous sources, primarily NMDOT road fund money. Um, and you can see the cost of funding of, um, the cost of 100% design complete is $1.2 million. And then there's the breakdown of the funding there. Um, our construction cost estimates, the phasing will be Pueblo Solano to Ranchitos Road. Ranchitos Road to either just south or north of Paseo del Norte Bridge, depending on the cooperation of NMDOT on what we will, any, any improvements needed for the bridge. And then the final phase will be either south or north of the bridge all the way to the village limits. And the current construction cost estimate for the entirety of the project is $27.7 million. So we are looking at the first phase, 2A, to Ranchito Road, in the amount of almost $9 million. And the funding we have in place right now includes a balance of funding from phase one, the first construction area. We have um, two legislative appropriations, and that includes one we just received in this past session, and a million dollars in federal COVID relief funds. We have additional applications out to numerous sources, primarily NMDOT, and we participate in the Mid-Region Council of Governments um, Transportation Improvement Program, where we are, it's called the TIP, where we propose projects for funding for rating and ranking for Federal Highway Administration funding, and we are designing to those standards as if we are going to receive that funding. So there are, this is primarily, this is all 
state and federal funding, and that means we have to design to specific standards of federal highways and NMDOT for roadways. Now it's your turn, Devin. Thank you, Maria. So uh, my name is Devin Kinnamore, and I'm with Pathfinder Environmental, and we have been tasked with completing uh, the environmental compliance for the project. Uh, when these projects are funded through uh, federal agencies and uh, often as this one come through the NMDOT, uh, there's a certain requirement to uh, uh, make sure that the project is going to comply with all the various uh, uh, federal and state regulations as they apply to uh, the environment. So uh, there were uh, three uh, particular areas in this corridor that we are looking most closely at. Uh, number one is uh, cultural resources. Uh, we hired a firm called Paleo West to, uh, to go out and do a survey of the entire corridor. Uh, they uh, identified 68 buildings uh, that have uh, eligibility as uh, historic structures. And so they have been working on uh, documenting all of those buildings and updating forms for them uh, in compliance with the regulations. Uh, we expect to have that finished this month. Um, we also uh, are looking at uh, conducting biological surveys uh, in the areas where there's uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, ponds are going to go and wherever there's vegetation. We'll be taking a look at those and documenting that also for the record for the DOT. Um, and then uh, uh, the third piece is the uh, hazardous materials uh, uh, <clears throat> work that we did. Uh, we prepared uh, an initial site assessment for the project, which is uh, basically a, a document that uh, consists of uh, questionnaires for property owners uh, in the area, uh, a, an on-site survey of all the areas where work is going to take place, uh, historical reviews and databases that are available uh, through the state uh, to identify anything that might be in the area, such as uh, a leaky underground storage tank or any other contamination uh, that may be in the project corridor that could be uh, potentially uh, uh, <clears throat> encountered during construction. The main thing there is to make sure that the project is not, um, you know, in the middle of construction, uncover uh, hazardous materials. Uh, that has been completed. And so uh, the next step after we uh, uh, <clears throat> wrap up the, uh, the documentation for the uh, cultural and biological will be to prepare uh, what the DOT calls a, a categorical exclusion checklist, uh, which is basically uh, uh, just a, a long list of all the, the things that we have to, all, all, the, all the regulations and all the things that we have to look at. It's a lot more than the, the three main things that we're doing in-depth surveys on, but we have to look into every one of them to make sure uh, that the project uh, is in compliance with all of them. So we'll prepare that, uh, and then uh, we'll submit all of, the, all of the documentation to the DOT, and uh, their environmental personnel will review it, make sure it's complete and, and accurate, and once they've approved of it, they'll sign off on it, and, uh, and the environmental process will be complete. And we expect that that'll be all wrapping up here very soon. Great, so um, we can take uh, questions and comments now. Uh, we'll pass the microphone around the audience because we are recording this. Right oh, okay. Um, but also then we're, we'll be available for like an open house format where you can say, okay, this is my property. What are you doing right here? Oh, no. Uh, so we can do both this evening. Hmm. The NMT T guy just has to be the first one, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, okay. I'll try to talk louder. Um, that might work, right? Yeah. Um, two questions. During your biological surveys, did you in conjunction with those surveys, did you do subsurface underground engineering to determine if there's uh, existing or even abandoned utilities? So that wouldn't be done in the biological? Right. We did do subsurface utility investigations. Okay. Uh, we contracted with Cobb Fenley to do that, 
and they came out and they um, they sounded it, and plus got records from the utility companies. <laughs> okay, and and I guess my second question, and it leads to a to a parallel, is are there were there any were there any surveys done to determine the the when you did your historical surveys to determine whether or not that there be a, a vibration risk during construction? Um, yeah, thank you. So um, uh, the, uh, the buildings, all, all the buildings were updated uh, and vibrations are a uh, common practice with uh, street construction, as you know, through compaction. Uh, and so one of the things that we look at uh, when we're doing our assessment of the potential impacts to historic buildings in the area uh, is uh, is vibratory equipment and if the uh, if the state shipo and the DOT uh, archaeologists think that uh, there's a potential uh, for vibratory impacts to historical buildings then they'll recommend mitigation uh, some alternative methods for compaction that that uh, you know either some sort of distances to remain away from the building where you use vibratory uh, or they'll, uh, or they'll, you know, recommend other compaction methods in order to minimize the effects on those buildings. One last question for Maria. Maria, uh, is the village is, has the village already considered um, contractors or a prospective prospective bidding list that uh, they may bid on this on this work? No, Tim, until we have our preferred alternative, we're and um, no, we're not even close to that yet. We want to complete all of our required certifications and um, get to 100% design before we even start talking about through the bidding process. You know, New Mexico is a low bid state, it'll be a competitive bid process. So we'll just have to see how that shakes out. Um, we will look at for any preferred NMDOT preferred contractors, and we always look at state contract um, for procurement, possible procurement purposes, but at the cost, these costs associated with this project, it, it's our intent to, to our, um, just put it out for bid. And to final this out, have you all considered anybody for construction management as far as uh, consultants that will, that will assist the the village with construction management. So we have um, we have we have engineers on retainer, and we have um, we continue to work with the inspector from phase one, who was a subcontractor um, with the prime on that project, who has a continuing relationship with with the village. So yeah, we have we have we have some in mind, but oh yeah, we'll cover all those bases, Tim. Okay. Anyone else? Pass the mic around. Do you have any ideas for the speed limit? By ordinance, the village has set the speed limit to 25 miles per hour within the construction zone. And during the project phases, construction phases, it will be reduced to 25 and it'll stay that way. But the, the Board of Trustees has also in the past considered and may consider again 25 throughout the limits of the village. But Absolutely. With the lane reduction, it is a 25 mile an hour speed limit throughout. And what about the crosswalks? Yes. First and foremost, this is a safety, pro safety project for pedestrians as well as traffic management of vehicular. There will be pedestrian either pathways or sidewalks, and there will be numerous crosswalks at key locations, at, certainly at intersections, but potentially also at mid-block crossings. What about at the ditch, um, right at? Mm, oh, I know where you're talking Chamesa about. At Chamisa, Chamisa yeah. lateral, yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's a highly traffic, that's okay. an informal yep. trail as it is. Do it all the time. And I will take it, and this is my pet peeve, visibility coming out of my road, Nuevo Hacienda, onto fourth. Is it gonna improve? I can tell you that we are required to provide line of sight clearance at all intersections throughout the project. We have driveways, all access, egress, and intersections that will be provided for, yes. Okay, thank you.
I, I can tell you that, I mean, even in the first phase, we had to remove some landscaping at the final end of the project because we hadn't met clear site triangles. So we're particularly sensitive to that. Any telephone pole removals? <laughs> so relocation of utilities. Utilities is a whole phase in unto itself. So we will be working with all of the utilities, excuse me, the utility authority, Bernalillo County, City of Albuquerque, Water Utility Authority, for any replacement or relocation of water and sewer. And then we'll be working with PM Gas Company. Um, I, I really wish we had the money to put power underground. We don't. That's more than all the funding that we would probably have for the construction. But so as appropriate, utilities are required to move in a public right of way commiserate to what our improvements in that right of way is at, at their cost. Is there anybody here from the city? No, there isn't. But we'll go through an entire utility phase with all of them involved. Well, my name is Gaylord Campbell, and I own a business there, Copper Bell Antiques. And we've been there seven years now, so we went through the last construction and so forth. And I guess I, I, I just wonder what's driving the need for it to go farther to, to this extent. I know there was some discussions before about restriping it to lose the lane of traffic, slow traffic, and so forth. But you see on your maps, the, the density tremendously reduces space between businesses and everything. Um, and the timing, uh, because of the, when we, the last construction, took forever and there's issues, I know. Um, and then we came out of it and we have <laughs> the last couple of years which have been very difficult. And we think we're getting back up on our feet and so forth and then there's external dynamics that create some other issues for us. This is something that I just wonder why now and is it needed at all uh, to this extent? And along those lines, it's a no brainer option for here. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, just a quick comment, and then I'll pass it on to Jeanette to add to my comments as well. So as I said, this is a safety project for pedestrian and vehiculars for people who use multimodal opportunities within the corridor. We, we do, I, I've often heard nobody walks within the corridor. Well, you make the improvements as we did in phase one, and you see people there all day long. Um, there are no improvements now. It, I walk up and down that corridor all the time. I delivered the notices to businesses last Wednesday, and it is unsafe. It is unpleasant. And we've created a phenomenally beautiful aspect of the Main Street corridor within this community with phase one. We don't have the funding to design and construct to that level of amenity colored concretes, and all of the beautiful, absolutely remarkable things you see in phase one. So it will be pared down. It was always the consideration of the village that because of the density of businesses in that area, this would be the jewel in the crown. Now, as we go north, it's not just an attempt to create a safe environment, but it's also an attempt to spur additional development, to fill in those empty lots, to turn over some of the more inappropriate land uses there, to create opportunity and to create amenity that draws from other parts of the village along that corridor all the way to our village limits. And I don't think people outside this village quite understand what, it, what is offered here, because when you're here and you're walking up and down or driving as you have to now, the number of businesses and the uniqueness of the business community going north is pretty, pretty significant. Um, the Antique Mile is probably the most successful business association the village has ever seen. But the opportunity now, based on a destination that villages have to create that and to build upon what's existing. And then with the village center coming in on the south end of town, I don't really want to get into that project, but just to mention the development that is occurring within the cor corridor, I think the timing is especially important to continue to move north. And then there's funding. We have managed in a year to amass more than $2 million. And we believe that there's greater opportunity 
with the stimulus funding at the state level and coming down to the federal level to be able to fund at least the first phase within the next couple of years. And then it is simply a matter of funding. But the importance of getting to 100% design is that then we have better leverage in securing funding. You've heard the term shovel-ready project. That's why we made the decision to design through the whole corridor so that when we have the opportunity to seek construction fundings, we can say we're ready. We have design. We're ready to go. Um, and though that's an incredibly important position to be in when you're seeking funding. So, um, and thank you for your acknowledgement of what your alternative preference is. Did I, did I address that? And anything else you'd like to add? Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is, is I was out here driving the corridor last week and a lady, two ladies came along to the bus stop and one of them with a cane. So the younger one helped the older one to sit down on the ground until the bus came. I didn't think it was appropriate to take their picture, but I thought, this is why we're doing this. <laughs> you know, because I think if, if you make it easier for people to use facilities, they will use them. <laughs> um, and I do have a question again. I'm sorry to repeat this, but um, on the roundabout, um, you mentioned about its safety and avoiding crashes. Is there any numbers on, on a dangerous intersection there? I mean, how do you want it? Uh, well, it won't be by the school, but at uh, Ranchitos? Yeah, um, no, not necessarily. A lot of crashes on the south part of the corridor. Unfortunately, we couldn't fit it in Or Ortega because you really do have quite a few crashes at Ortega. I think there were 20 crashes in a um, three-year period, three or four. So, and that's quite a few crashes. And, it, and I thought maybe it was a sight distance issue coming over Paseo, but I think people are just... Uh, it, it's far enough away from the sale, but I think people are flying over that overpass, and people are trying to turn out of there, and they they can't make it. <laughs> so, what material are you looking at using for the turn lanes? For you mean the the well the, the center, the center turn, turn lane? I, I know you have. Concrete here that would, it turns black anyway. Uh, we're just looking at using asphalt for the whole thing for this portion. Very good. <laughs> Hi, um, Joe Craig. Um, 505 Calle del Pajarito Northwest, um, president of the CDP Neighborhood Association, we're going to be affected uh, tremendously by this project. I'm pretty excited. I'm very excited about it. I mean, I think this is almost, I think, more exciting, particularly for us, than the, uh, the uh, phase one. Um, we were just south of Paseo del Norte off 4th and off the, um, the uh, Paseo del Norte Bridge. The, um, I have a number of comments. One, this has a very urban feel to it. Uh, for triple what we paid for phase one, I think we need, I, I, I want more Ur, uh, rural, we are not rural, we are an urban community or semi-urban. I'm not sure what we really call ourselves, but um, I want more of a rural feel through this. Um, that's just my personal comment. I like the west side path uh, because from personal ob observations, the schools, my walking, uh, most of the, the foot traffic is on the west side. So I think that would be beneficial. Um, I'm concerned about Ortega, and I think we all are. Um, there's going to have to be a something there. I don't know what it is. We are the next road south of that. Traffic is is high. They're coming over the bridge. We we with Maria and the mayor. We got at least the bridge access stabilized with with the NMDOT. Thank you. 
So there need I think we need to have a some sort of vision of what that bridge is in relation to this with with walking. I mean, I walk from my neighborhood north to our our fabulous Del Norte open space, and um, I may be the only one doing that, but it's it's scary. And um, my road is just south of that. We have a NMDOT property at Calle del Pajarito and Fourth that uh, Maria and Ann and we've all talked about maybe doing an entrance to the our great um, Del Norte bike path, which and then with signs um, saying, "Hey, here's steel benders. Here's other places to ride your bike too." Um, and I really like the the park or something there at, at El Pueblo, I think. Uh, Trustee Benavides has, has mentioned that. Um, doing something with that as an entrance to the village, maybe connecting it with this um, entrance to the Del Norte, to the Del Norte bike path would be, would be great. Uh, right now it's just blowing dust onto our apartments, uh, the senior living and the uh, other apartments and, and Lauterberger. Lauterberger is, and we've advocated for this, is moving back to the back of their property. And I'd sort of like to see a Los Ranchos, Lauterberger, uh, uh, something there. And then really helping uh, uh, helping the, the dust, I guess. Um, I don't, I, I, I'm not liking bikes together with traffic at all. I've a point, a point coming down here on Rio Grande. Uh, there was about five or six bikes riding, uh, and they were riding side by side. They were out in the Rio Grande. I had to swerve around them. Um, they created a dangerous condition. Um, you know, our traffic usually is what I blame, but you know, the bikes have a responsibility. But I like separate paths for bikes and and pedestrians. We've had even had. Uh, you know, some deaths on Paseo del Norte from cars running over that onto the bike path. Uh, Ranchitos, I like the roundabouts. Um, I believe at at um, El Pueblo, El Pueblo's dangerous, slowing that down. I don't know quite how you'd handle the pedestrian bike paths across there. Um, Ranchitos, I like that roundabout. That when I was a kid, which is a long time ago, my dad call that dead man's curve. And we've had serious deaths and injuries uh, because of the speed and, of course, of the intersection. So uh, lar larger roundabouts seem to be, I seem to prefer them. Uh, the, the smaller, tighter ones that slow down traffic uh, are just awkward. And we have, we do have farm vehicles. We have tra trucks with trailers and things. Um, the Miller feed, which is the opening to our Del Norte open space, that access is very awkward. I don't know in, if it was a, uh, a private group coming up before planning and zoning that we'd, e we'd even approve that access and the parking and the whole area. So there, I think that needs to be addressed because it's just on the north side of the, the Paseo Bridge. And I think that is dangerous. Um, and then yeah, I guess some work on the, the Paseo Bridge. I, I'm really excited about this, Mayor. I think this is great. I think we have a great opportunity. Um, as, I don't know if this is the appropriate place, but as an aside on art work, which I think will probably be incorporated in this, I'd really like to see something uh, addressing Robin Hopkins and our uh, first responders as artwork, and that would be in phase you know, back in our phase one, but 10 years is coming up next next year of um, Robin defending us. So uh, uh, I think that's all my comments for right now, but thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. I appreciate your work. And again, I, I, I feel like I want more rural feel in the, the landscaping and the design, so. Great, thank you. That was a lot of good comment. Uh, we will be looking at each of the access points as part of our preliminary design. 
uh, once we have a preferred alternative. Um, and then also, I just want to throw out that if you if we put in a roundabout, the middle of a roundabout is a wonderful place for art, as long as you can see around it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Joe. I'd, I'd also like to comment on something that you said about the potential for connectivity and not just consideration of bike trails connecting throughout the corridor, but a project like this, especially in the phase from Ranchitos to El Pueblo, gives us the opportunity to also make the connections to other important aspects in the community, like the Gateway District. So Tiffany Justice is sitting in the back there, our um, planning and zoning administrator. She and our intern are working on looking at that portion of the code for the Gateway. And we see that in this project as an opportunity to make some critical connections, uh, multimodal connections from 4th Street to 2nd Street to the rail runner station to make that vision of overall community connectivity um, become a reality. So we're thinking along the same lines as you. Thank you for that comment. I'm Bob Kears. I live on 7,000 block of Guadalupe Trail. I have five questions. Are we going to have bus turnouts or do we have to wait for the bus to move down the single lane? Okay. Uh, there, there aren't planned to be bus turnouts because then there wouldn't be room for pedestrians or a path. Um, but however, we will have the um, continuous left turn lane in the middle. So there would be room to pass a bus if, if it is wasn't it, being used for turning. Is it, is it legal to pass a bus in the turning lane? I have a real problem with that. I don't know. I guess we'll have to look into that. <laughs> Please do, because if you, if it's illegal to use the passing lane, then if we get behind a city bus, we get to stop at every bus stop for three miles. It'd be a bit painful. Potentially. Okay, I have another question. Um, on the designs, the pedestrian paths looked like they were wide enough for a regiment to walk down. Uh, why? So, so the standard width of a, a combined walking bike biking path is ten feet. <laughs> Um, so it is big enough to drive on, and that's often why you see bollards to prevent vehicles from getting on them. Okay, thank you. The radius of the roundabouts, are they, is the radius large enough to handle an 18-wheeler? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, okay. The, there is a, there's the center part that's raised, and then there's what's called a truck apron around the center, which... Uh, the back wheels of the truck are supposed to track on that part. Um, All right. As long as the radius is big enough, they'll do that. The truckers mm -hmm. don't want to be running over curbs. Um, on the first project, partway through, the contractor found asbestos pipe. Has, is there still more in the ground, and what's the plan to do about it? So we are doing the utility coordination so we can get as much of that information up front as possible. Well, um, on the first phase, nobody told the designers there was asbestos in there. Now, we who have lived here a while knew it was, but the engineers didn't. Okay. Yes. I mean, often water lines are asbestos, and that is a consideration. Um, we are looking at where we can place the storm drain pipe to avoid relocating as many utilities as possible. So it, it's a storm drain system, whereas the first section was permeable pavement with a like a French drain underneath it would be a way to describe it, where the water soaks into the ground. Um, so it is, it is a different concept. <laughs> yeah, except we spec, spent a hell of a lot of money removing asbestos pipe in that first phase, and it shut the project down for a long time. So we don't have to remove it if we don't, if we don't touch it. Well, I know. Yeah. I've, I'm an asbestos removal instructor. <laughs> I know a little bit about it. Um, 
I live on Guadalupe. When we start, started the first phase, I asked if anybody had done an environmental impact on what would happen on Guadalupe. No. Well, the traffic has doubled. Now some of the neighbors want speed bumps. What's the plan? So I don't know the plan on Guadalupe. So we will look at potential impacts on adjacent neighborhoods and address them accordingly, mostly through traffic control, Mr. Kears. Yeah, I would like a lot more patrolmen out there, yeah. So we'll, we'll certainly try to coordinate that with our public safety guy, but we will do um, like no, no, we'll use traffic control devices to direct traffic away from residential neighborhoods unless absolutely necessary for detour purposes if we encounter something in construction, but we will do our best to keep traffic. Our intent is to direct commuter traffic onto Second Street. It's always our intent. If we see that occurring in the residential areas, we will add additional traffic control and patrol. Now, from my very narrow, narrow point of view, um, it's only partially effective. Thank you. Yes, we, we can address what we can address. Um, since we have NMDOT here and Trustee uh, Pacheco has been vocal about our second and Paseo interchange, which we're talking about now diverting more traffic over onto Second Street, that's really, I don't know what NMDOT is doing, but really needs a look, a heavy look by the state. Um, I think we've made a patchwork of fixes for years there, and um, it's pretty scary. I, I, I drive that, I drive that into the fix in Lindsay. You know, and yeah. I have the same principles. Uh, I, I live on the west side, mm. which is the same yeah. away from, from the Rumbles, and uh, you're right. Unfortunately, uh, the problem is the virus in the ER, I will not commit you to the ER. No. NMDOT has been really great to work with. So, by the way. I, and I know it's a lot, a lot of money to and, fix, uh, but. Uh, money is okay, but when I was, when I was putting the bridge engineer for the district, uh, I, I'm the one that, that uh, did or coordinated all the work for stabilizing the bridge. Uh, mm, okay, the yeah, hill. yeah. And I, I wanted to, to do some stabilization work there at that intersection, or that whole uh, knot. My authority as a bridge engineer ends 50 feet from Lisa Pope's travel and parking drive. So I, the yep. maintenance engineer, it, and, you know, she's scheduled maintenance. I don't know when it's scheduled because I don't work in that section right. of the district. But um, that's a tool and that's still in the contract. Good. Thank you. I, I very much appreciate what the village is trying to do uh, and that uh, um, uh, we're, we're looking at improving the road. Um, however, I do have some comments that I'd like to go down on the record. Um, <clears throat> one of my concerns is that these roads all look very suburban, not urban, in my opinion. They don't look like the village. And so I'd like to hear what you have to say about what you would do to make the roads less, less um, 
centric towards moving traffic and dealing with utilities and safety and more look like the village of Los Ranchos and the semi-rural environment that we have here. So the um, the alternative three that we have is is the same typical section as was used in 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 phase one. Um, yeah, that would be yes that one with with the sidewalk and landscaping, and and I do feel like um, the landscaping does make it friendlier. I feel like the sidewalk are going to bring people out and have they're going to walk on this and they whereas they don't now because they don't feel safe. Um, I, we are reducing the width of the roadway, which makes it less vehicle-centric and more pedestrian-centric. <laughs> Jeanette, what are the uh, traffic lane widths? We're looking at 11-foot lanes. <laughs> I would suggest 10 just to slow traffic, because it shouldn't all be about, uh, and I'm just saying, <clears throat> because it shouldn't all be about the width of the of the lane for cars, but the width of the lane to slow the traffic as well. It, it does <clears throat> it does calm traffic if you do narrower lanes. Um, when I say 11 feet, I'm counting the gutter width. Ah. So the, really the asphalt is narrower, and so it will have a narrower feel to it. <laughs> what kind of right, what kind of radii are you using for the corners? Um, the only corners that we've really laid out are the ones at the major, at the signalized intersections. I see. You got it. Yeah. Um, did did you look at land uses yet in terms of um, kind of where catalytic projects might be that could uh, uh, re require or at least look towards? A different kind of roadway in front of them, so where there might be future development, for instance. <clears throat> I, I was going to say, not not as part of our scope. <laughs> um, Trustee Radnovich, the we as we come to the process of bidding, we will include um, potential additive alternates for additional amenity at identified places that could be considered catalyst areas, but that's pretty much funding dependent. But yes, that's an, at this consideration, and our administrator and I've had many discussions with the mayor about, um, we don't want this to these continuing sections north to be in such stark contrast with the beauty of phase one, and then it's just grayscape going north. That's not the intention of all. We will build an amenity with landscaping and lighting and different uh, materials as funding is available. Um, why didn't you consider on-street parking to slow traffic? Well, um, we could go with on-street parking, and, and in those areas, you would lose landscaping yes. because it is it is very narrow. There's just the sixty feet. <laughs> Um, additionally, trustee, there is less need for on-street parking as you go north, as many of the businesses, I would say the majority of the businesses have formalized parking lots, if you will, and are not using the right-of-way as they were in phase one with the buildings built right up against the right-of-way. So it's not as big an issue. Thank you, Maria. However... Um, those businesses could change. Uh, one example of where on-street parking could work very well is in front of Casa Benavides. Um, another um, might be towards the end of the project near Farm and Table. So those are areas that could benefit from on-street parking, and it does slow traffic. Mm -hmm. And as you know, traffic goes 50 until it can get until it gets to phase one, and then it it. Uh, goes 40. <laughs> it, it, well, then it goes, it slows down, but, but uh, the slower, the better as far as I'm concerned. So I think on-street parking would be worth considering, especially okay. in those areas like that. Absolutely. We'll take that into consideration. Trustee, one of the other things that, we, that I want to say about that is that as Bernalillo County proceeds with their project south from Alameda, they'll, 
certainly do the same lane configuration as us. They'll do a reduction to one travel lane in each direction and a continuous turn lane. It looks like they're going for uh, bike lanes on both sides of the project. So the, our biggest constriction in design is the width of the right-of-way without having to acquire from private property owners. So that's a huge consideration. What is it that we give up with on-street parking and what is it that we gain? Especially if most of the of the buildings out there have parking facilities already. But you're right, it's a balancing act. The phase one had the same right of way. I'll just mention that. Correct. But <clears throat> most of the businesses did not have formalized parking. They were actually, and you know this because of the issues that we had with businesses when we took away what they perceived to be their parking. That was just incredibly uncomfortable and an issue throughout the project. And it's it's stabilized a bit um, because we were able to provide four more parking spaces, um, net parking spaces than what was taken away, primarily through the use of the um, parking lot. But again, we haven't considered that as an issue going north, except that you're right, it's an, it's an exceptional traffic calming. Um, the other thing that we've seen with on-street parking is still, there's still a hesitancy to use on-street parking. There just is. People have a perceived difficulty with on-street parking. So all those things would be taken into consideration, but in a right-of-way with the width that we have and the buildings that are more set back and have their own facilities, it hasn't been as big an issue. Yeah, that, I appreciate that. Just saying we did landscaping and and sidewalks and on-street parking and uh, all of that in the 60-foot right-of-way, so. Okay, I've got a few more and I'll give it to you. <laughs> um, so 4th Street is not a NMDOT road anymore, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. I know that. <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, why are we going to DOT for the design? Because DOT does design highways more than the, they design main streets. Actually, trustee, um, NMDOT is the funding agency. Um, and they administer all of the federal funds as well. And we are required to design to their standards. And when you say New Mexico Highway and Transportation Department, you're talking not only about the highway system like I-25 and even what used to be old US-85. You're talking about corridors through communities throughout the state of New Mexico. That's so, right. So, yes, um, this has to be designed to standards to accommodate the level of service that exists out there and for future use. It has requirements for ADA, Americans with Disability Acts, ADA accessible pedestrian amenities, and there are stormwater requirements, for example, for a 100-year storm. Your design must at least accommodate that. Those are all requirements of NMDOT, who, and that's where our funding comes from, and that's where our funding will come from, so yes. And and additionally, I mean, I have to say that it that it is a roadway. And as a municipality, we're responsible for stormwater management. We're responsible for pedestrian safety. We're responsible for vehicular safety. So all of those things have to be considered regardless of the funding, but they're our funding source. It is also a main street, Maria. And I can point out many roads in the state of New Mexico that have an MDOT improvements going through them that lost their Main Street character when it happened. So that happens to just, just saying. <laughs> Trustee, we are very conscious of that. We're conscious of the environment in which we are working and th this will not be this will not be that situation. This will be appropriate to the scale, the size, and the level of service of the village. Will you be having other public meetings after this one as we go further into the design of the project? That is, as we get into the into the project, yes. Once the alternative is um, selected, then it'll be up to the board of trustees. But we anticipate having, throughout the design phase, additional public information meetings. Absolutely. If if we could, you know, it's hard to even. I mean, I'm a little bit disappointed in the turnout. 
Um, it's a great turnout, <laughs> but you had to dig down into the village website just to get to the notice for the meeting. It was kind of not, you know, it, it so was in the paper. That's right. And, and trustee, I personally walked the corridor and oh, visited good. all of the businesses and the residences that I could find. But I, I will say that, I mean, I've been doing public hearings for almost 30 years. Often, if people don't have an issue or they're, they have confidence in their local government or they like the project that was built and they can now envision something, um, people think, well, this is cool. I don't really have anything to add. But we're, we are soliciting additional written comment. Um, we, you're streaming. You're streaming live. We're streaming live, and um, we will we'll make every every possible opportunity to keep people updated. I personally do a project management update at every single Board of Trustees meeting accompanied with a report that's public. So we will do everything we can think of and take every suggestion to make sure that everyone has all of the information as we proceed. Great. Um, the uh, historic buildings, are any of them, uh, um, you said there were 68 along this reach of the corridor, of the, of the main street. Um, are any of them on the historic register now? Or, or are they just all eligible? They're all eligible, yeah. So no, I, I thought the uh, building on the corner of, northwest corner of uh, El Pueblo and 4th Street is actually on the historic register. Yeah, I, I don't have a, like in my mind, a specific you know, of which ones uh, may be on it or not. Yeah. There one Say what? Down? Yeah, there might Northwest. be one. Yeah. yeah. The, one, the one one block north of uh, Pueblo and... It's an old, it's an old Tarone project, I mean, mm -hmm. house. I have one other question. As a former painter, I have a sore point about the paint job that we put on the steel. When I asked about, well, the paint job that was put on the, the parking structures didn't even last six months. And the answer I got was, oh, it's just cosmetic. Well, isn't this whole project just cosmetic? Aren't we? Are we going to put a better paint job or just forget the paint job at all and let them rust? Yeah, that's patina. That's right. So you're talking about the supports on the bus shelters? Say it again, please. You're talking about the supports on the bus shelters? Yes. Yes. Well, the, the whole bus shelter is rusting. So our, our um, designers were satisfied that it, that it was not an issue. And that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of aesthetics, and some people do like the patina, which is what is happening out there now. But um, we'll just make sure that whatever we spec, we spec. Thank you. I have a question. About, again, I come from a business owner there, and so I wondered about uh, traffic counts. Before phase one, after what phase one did, currently on phase two, and what a, 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 a single lane, 25 mile an hour zone, everything would, would impact the traffic. Um, you know, that's, that's a, a, a concern. I know that if we can push it all to Second Street for commuter traffic, that's one thing, but going five miles of 25 mile an hour drives people crazy. Uh, and I just wondered if it pushes people away. Um, the other thing is, you, down in phase one, you mentioned there is no bike path. But you have sidewalks, and you mentioned it had to be 10 feet if you do both. And, and if there's bike paths up on 2nd Street and a bike path north of Paseo to tie into Academy, or to uh, Alameda, I mean, um, why not just omit it during, this, during that short period there, that the middle period where it doesn't tie into anything, and you get extra space to make a comfortable road and so forth. 
So when I said 10 feet, that's if you have an asphalt, like walking trail, pedestrian bicycle trail. Um, you can narrow those to eight feet where there's right away and there's no room for it. But um, particularly with NMDOT funding, it's, it's eight foot, at least five foot from the roadway, very specific roles for that. Um, you could, uh, now when, when you're saying end it, where are you talking about ending it at? As far as the bike path? Mm -hmm. you, well, at, there's nothing on phase one. Right. Mm -hmm. And you said that from Ortega, where the state's doing to Alameda, they're connecting bike paths. So there is none on 4th Street there. Or is there a need if there's up on 2nd Street, they can connect it somewhere. So why even include it in that stretch? So um, I do think that you probably still want the ability for pedestrians to, Correct, to go yeah, through that, sure. especially since there's an open space there. Um, there is a way to get over Pasal del Norte, which is along one of the, the ditches. Um, down, like down Ortega, on the other side of that open space, it is there. There's always the possibility of of doing um, a bike connection there, and then not carrying it south of Pasal del Norte. <laughs> Just my my question about the traffic counts: Is there available numbers out there somewhere to? So we did do traffic counts at Ortega and the three signalized intersections, and we we do have that data. Um, it'll be. It's, it's in a traffic study that the village could put online. Um, I I did a traffic analysis of the three lanes versus the four lanes, and it, it still works uh, quite well. <laughs> I think um, as a traffic engineer, we talk about level of service, which I know doesn't mean mean much to to uh, people, but um, anything level of service D or or uh, better is supposed to be uh, acceptable, and um, everything on this corridor is level service B or C <laughs> with the existing traffic that's out there right now. <laughs> The difference between alternative four and alternative three is that the water drains into the plants on the side and the cost is less. Is that a correct statement? I don't know that the cost would be much less because you're still pouring that ribbon curb along the edge. Um, but I, I do think the storm drain system would be less expensive. I'm looking at my drainage engineer here. Make sure I'm stating that correctly. <laughs> Does this mean Lake Waterburger will go away? <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, we have a lot of photos of existing conditions with standing water within the right of way, and all of that will be addressed. That's that's really important because what we what the intent of these projects is is to retain our water that falls in the public right of way, so that we are not flooding either the one the public right of way or impacting adjacent private properties. So that's those are the the issues that we will be dealing with um, in the drainage portion of this project. It's a quarter after seven, and we are streaming this live, and the meeting ends at 7.30, and I just wanted to give people the opportunity to get up and stretch and look at the um, placards in the back and, and discuss with us as we walk around. JT, did you have a question? He asked. Um, and and um, just give, give, you, give you an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one discussion with the, with the designers and with the Board of Trustees and any of anybody else who's here in the audience. There's a white box on the back where the cookies and the water are, and we really thank you and appreciate your participation in this, and we look forward to talking to you in the future. Uh, 
How will you compile the, uh, the, the information you're getting from the public? So we will continue to take public comment. I've received numerous emails, and I think um, Jeanette has as well, and we'll keep that open. And we collect it all because it's all part of the process and will be put into in all of the documentation of 4th Street as we move forward. So this is being recorded as well as any of the notes we take and all of these forms that are turned in become part of the public record. So public meeting documentation goes in both the study when we final it and also in the environmental NEPA documentation. Thank you again.